Um, hello, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for the webinar today with Ali Salman uh, for the title Building in My name is Ira Alkari. I'm the coordinator for Democracy and Governance at the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs. And um, I'll be your moderator. Um, before I hand over to Ali, um, this is a short introduction uh, on Ali of the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs, IDEAS, and also CEO and founding member of the Both organizations based in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, Ali is an economist by training, uh, and he has authored uh, Discord of Social Justice and Economic Freedom in Islam, as well as Libertarian Char Characteristics of the Islamic Market Economy. He is currently based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, um, but he's originally from Pakistan. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over uh, the this evening session to Ali. Uh, thank you, Ira, um, for the introduction. Um, and um, so we have now uh, starting this, uh, this, we are starting the webinar now. Um, I would say hel hello to Amin and also Isabel uh, who are here. I guess we should start and hopefully some more participants will uh, join during the course of discussion. Uh, today's uh, topic um, we have chosen is the Islamic foundations of uh, market economy, um, in which I am going to uh, discuss uh, certain principles um, of economy uh, as per my own understanding, um, as founded um, in the primary sources of uh, Islam, uh, Quran and Hadith. And uh, later on, I will present some uh, thoughts from the classical. Uh, jurists as well as uh, scholars um, who have uh, talked about um, uh, economy and also uh, in the end I will talk about the uh, modern subject the uh, modern subject of Islamic economics and I will hopefully draw some comparison and end at the need of um, some more research in this area. I have uh, prepared uh, a presentation just to ease our discussion. Um, and um, so I will go with that. Um, I, like, I would like to start uh, our conversation on the Islamic concepts of market economy uh, with this uh, verse of Quran, uh, which is uh, chapter number two, uh, Surah Al-Jumma, verse number nine and 10. Uh, translation by NJ Daud, uh, which translates as uh, believers when you are summoned to Friday prayers hasten to the remembrance of God and cease your praying that would be best for you if you but knew it then when the prayers are ended disperse and go your ways in quest of God's bounty remember God ways uh, God always so that you may prosper um, I consider this verse uh, as an important uh, uh, you know, uh, instruction, important guideline uh, uh, from God I, Almighty to Muslims, um, which is saying that uh, you know, immediately after the Friday prayer, you have to go back to uh, to commerce to seek your risk, and and therefore there is no um, uh, you know there is no separation uh, in that sense. And um, therefore, commerce you know, occupies a very central importance in uh, the Islamic history and Islamic uh, civilization as well. Um, as I mentioned, what are the, uh, what are the principles uh, of uh, economics in Islam? Um, and um, I will use uh, some of the important verses which I which I found very relevant for discussion, um, and then I'm also I'm um, the um, I'm also explaining the principles which 
which can be derived from these verses. So the first principle um, I am drawing here is the importance of uh, voluntary exchange and trade with frugality and preference of savings over consumption. Um, actually, there are these are obviously different concepts: uh, voluntary exchange, and trade, as well as preference over savings, uh, preference of savings over consumption. But I see and I find this verse, chapter number four, uh, verse number twenty-nine, uh, as very really important and comprehensive um, guideline, which says that believers uh, do not consume your wealth among yourselves in vanity, but rather trade with it by mutual consent. Um, and uh, this this uh, this shows, as I said. Uh, the importance of both voluntary exchange and and trade, and at the same time the importance of um, the sa a saving, which is critical for uh, for trade. Uh, the second important principle, in my view, um, in in the divine's uh, scheme of economics, is mentioned in the chapter forty three and verse thirty two, which is um, it is. We who deal out to deal uh, to them their livelihood in this world, exalting some in ranks above others, so that one may take the other into his service. Uh, the uh, you know the the question and the notions of uh, equality and uh, inequality um, is one of the centrally more important, essentially most important and critical questions. Uh, in the discipline of um, of economics, um, and as we know from our reading of economics, um, this is still uh, this has still not been resolved. Uh, you know, economic thinkers have um, argued that um, we should seek more equality, um, like uh, Karl Marx, but then um, the 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 thinkers and the economists. More on the side of um, the um, uh, let's say free markets and and capitalism have argued otherwise and have they have accepted that um, it is uh, in, inequality is actually a natural outcome of uh, the uh, capitalistic mode of production in which different actors would play different roles um, and uh, we see. Uh, this message of God uh, that there are different uh, parts of society, they have different roles uh, in not just in this verse, but also in other places. And I uh, interpret this as an evidence of uh, acceptance of inequality um, as a science scheme, uh, which helps, uh, which provides uh, uh, us uh, as, as human beings, as agents, to actually move um, and actually to encourage us to be socially mobile. Um, the third uh, principle um, is the sanctity of property rights, for which I refer to the last uh, sermon of uh, Prophet Muhammad in which he said that, uh, oh people, just as you regard this month, this day, this city as sacred, so regard the life and property of every Muslim as a sacred trust. Um, the importance of you know, private property rights has been often mentioned as an important pillar of um, uh, economic thought process uh, in Islam and also this uh, is acknowledged as an important uh, institutional pillar market economy um, as uh, which can be contrasted with the planned or central plan uh, central planned economy in which the property rights are not privately owned uh, but they are uh, but, but they are defined and they are owned by the state uh, at large um, and we find various other examples uh, that Islam would respect private property rights and as and, and as such, it has uh, not imposed any upper limit on, for instance, the acquisition uh, of the property rights itself. Of the property itself. Um, however, there um, 
there are examples and there is a there are some discussions in um, in the Islamic history uh, which um, which which also indicate that there are certain limitations on uh, on the use of the property uh, although there is no limitation on how much you can acquire but there is a tradition um, attributed to the prophet um, in which the uh, if you have a land uh, and you don't harvest it plow it for three years then you uh, lose the ownership right on that land and um, then it can be given to other um, Muslims uh, to uh, who would be maybe better able to actually use that land and earn livelihood uh, obviously this limitation on the private property rights is something which is not consistent with our modern understanding of the property rights but i think there is a, this is an important distinction um, the fourth principle um, which i consider very very important is uh, the principle of price freedom um, and there uh, there's a hadith uh, which has been mentioned in um, uh, all the major compilation of hadith except uh, sahih bukhari um, with more or less similar wording at the time of messenger of god the market price rose in Medina, and the people said o messenger of god fix the price he replied god is the taker and the disposer the provider and the controller of prices i hope that when i meet him none of you will have a claim against me for an injury concerning life and property um, so in 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 this uh, uh, hadith we actually uh, see further endorsement of the principles of private property um, and um, uh, and and prophet's insistence uh, that he is not going to intervene in the prices um, uh, and it, it this this incident is reported over like a few times um, in Sira. Uh, which which means that they, th this is essentially a consistent and important principle in the economic policy set up by the Prophet uh, ﷺ himself. Um, they, um, uh, but in the interpretation of of his hadith, um, and I have written um, you know on this aspect a little bit more details um, in my essay. Uh, the uh, the, 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 the jurists have um, come up with various interpretations. Um, so for instance, uh, the, um, so there are two types of interpretations of this hadith. Um, one is the uh, Hanafi school, which, uh, which has actually argued that uh, although price control, which is Tas'ir, called, is called Tas'ir, in the Islamic law is um, prohibited but in certain circumstances uh, for the public welfare um, it um, it is warranted so they have found uh, uh, conditions and examples where they believe that the price you know price uh, control can be introduced uh, the other uh, interpretation uh, the other set of interpretation is coming from the um, Shafi'i school, um, which is more literalist, um, Shafi'i and Hamli school, which is more literalist interpretation of this hadith of um, price, uh, you know, pro prohibition of um, price control, and it says um, that um, actually price controls um, are not allowed and um, if you introduce price control it actually erodes the welfare principle uh, as such okay sorry let me see the prison
Okay. So I was at this slide, um, and for the benefit, I think for a few of our uh, participants who, who just uh, joined, uh, a very quick uh, recap. Uh, I'm on. Um, I'm explaining the principles of economics in Islam according to my understanding. And I've explained uh, four principles: uh, principle of voluntary exchange and trade. Um, second is acceptance of inequality as a divine scheme. Third is sanctity of private property rights. And fourth is uh, price freedom. And now I will uh, move on with this um, uh, description of the principles. So the principle number five um, is the, you know, sort of a definition of profit and, and wealth creation. The, this often comes as a part of discussion and economic policy how profit is determined, how much profit is um, sort of legitimate, um, is there a percentage uh, which is uh, recommended by Sharia. Um, obviously, there is no uh, fixed percentage mentioned uh, by, by the, you know, by, by sources of Sharia. Um, but I found a, a hadith which is uh, quite educative, uh, which um, uh, roughly translates as um, profit earned depends on the degree of risk assumed. Uh, it is uh, essentially in Arabic it is al-khilaj with zaman, just two words, um, and which, which shows um, that this kind of definition is, could only come also, uh, could also come from would only come from a prophet who himself has led a very active life as a trader and an entrepreneur who understood the dynamics of business with um, uh, with, with lot of depths. The um, another important principle um, in terms of the economics is uh, the definition of the market. Um, this actually uh, pertains to um, a practice um, uh, in in the Arab society at that time, which was then forbidden by the Prophet, that when uh, a karwa, a trade karwa, used to arrive uh, in the in the city of Medina. Now we are in Medina, and the Prophet had uh, assumed also role as a ruler. Uh, they, you know, people used to go outside uh, the city limits and uh, used to intercept the uh, incoming trade karma uh, and exchange of information. So they would, they would actually, you know, take the information about the demand from the city and, and go up to talk to traders. And, and um, so kind of a, a third party in the trade who, do, who are not directly who had not directly participated in the trade process itself. I mean, they were not customers and, of course, they were not suppliers. And the Prophet forbade um, this practice. Uh, uh, he said, Prophet said, that do not wait outside the town for persons who bring goods to the market in order to buy up their goods. Um, and interestingly, one of the um, very first institutions which the Prophet set up in Medina uh, after the masjid itself was uh, a physical space, uh, a, um, a marketplace. And he said that all transactions um, have to take place physically in that, um, in that boundary line. Um, um, and, you know, which, which allowed for, you can say, uh, better monitoring a better regulation uh, on uh, on the transaction on the economic transactions by then uh, state itself. The um, seventh uh, principle um, of economics, in, in my understanding, is is this institution of hisba. Um, in in very simple terms, hisba is. Um, you know, inspector or, or someone's, it's like an accountability institution. Um, the, 
the first um, muhtasib in in the market in that sense was um, Hazrat Umar Anhu, who was appointed by the Prophet um, um, to to take, to actually perform certain rules in the marketplace, which I consider important principles, important functions for consumer protection and um, enforcement of uh, contracts. Um, there, you know, there is uh, the research suggests that they actually played these roles. So they would do inspection of measures and quality of pr products. Uh, they would see if the contracts are enforced in the market. They would see as uh, that uh, they, their market rigidities and there are which speculative sales are not present. Uh, they would see. Uh, they would see. The, uh, they would ensure that price discrimination, uh, monopolistic practices, collusion, dumping, and hoarding of necessities is not practiced. And uh, they would also have some powers. They would give advice. But they would also uh, have powers. Uh, they had also powers by obstruction, by force, threaten, or even imprisonment, um, and um, even. Uh, expel, uh, expulsion of individuals from the market if they saw, um, if uh, the inspectors saw that these uh, conditions are not being met by um, any participant of the market. And so the, uh, the conclusion which I draw from this discussion uh, in terms of the economics principle is that largely we have an economic system in Islam which is uh, which is based on economic freedom which is based on private property rights um, price freedoms uh, trade freedoms um, and um, the uh, but there is also a great uh, sense of uh, consumer protection and of course uh, and and um, respect of consumer rights um, as you can see that in this list of uh, hisba, we do not have price control. So you have everything but price control in, in this uh, list of duties. And I think this is important to mention uh, then how this uh, combination of uh, uh, freedom and justice um, forms a part of, uh, forms a, or the constitute the fundamental parts of the um, economics um, in the Islamic principles. Um, I like to move on to certain uh, other aspects of uh, of economics um, in the Islamic foundations. Um, I think which are important also. Um, um, core discussion in economic freedom these days is uh, is about the size of the government, role of the government in the economy. In my humble opinion, uh, size of the government in the Islamic economy uh, should be capped at the size of zakat and other obligatory taxes on production, such as usher. Um, we know, for instance, that the range, uh, the rates uh, which have been defined uh, range from 2.5% to 10%. And uh, that is, in my view, um, the range in which uh, the uh, you know government should operate as a percentage of uh, GDP. Now, in um, in this day and age, this uh, looks quite Im, uh, impossible because the governments um, in in you know, let's say in, in US uh, about uh, fifty percent of GDP and uh, Germany is another plus fifty percent. Um, and you will see, you, you see, you know, very high rates of taxation elsewhere, um, which increases the size of the government. Size of the government. Um, however, if we go back, let, um, let's say about 100 years uh, before early 20th century, um, actually the size, uh, which, which I believe uh, before World War I, when we have the foundations of prosperity largely financed, uh, in which the you know, citizens and private sector were playing more important role. Uh, the uh, the size of the government in the GDP was about five to six percent in US, uh, in UK, in and other uh, uh, important capitals. 
products um, which uh, essentially suggest that a small government limited government uh, is better for economic freedom um, some of the uh, hadiths which i use as um, as evidence um, are, are mentioned here um, the, uh, after you have paid the zakat of your wealth you have paid all that was your all that was required of you by the state but there must be another uh, there is no share in the wealth of people for the state except a zakat um, so this has been mentioned in um, you know, the compilations of, uh, of these it suggests a small government is um, is indeed consistent with the islamic uh, notions of economy um also i think it's um, um, the, the 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 subject of inheritance and and, inherit, uh, and uh, has has received considerable attention in the islamic uh, law historically because quran has made very explicit guidelines on the inheritance it, itself um and therefore i believe that um in 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 the light of that principle and discussion uh, i say that a state uh, cannot claim inheritance and hence cannot impose any kind of inheritance tax in islam um the only exception is if a deceased person does not have any indirect or indirect relatives um uh, who could claim inheritance and then in that in that scenario the um, the property left um is associates to the state treasury otherwise uh, the details are very clear um uh, in fact uh, as we understand that uh, uh, according to islamic law only one third of the property can actually be written in a will um and also and so, um, so that's the maximum limit which can be left to the discretion of the person who um uh, who has left a property now this means two things one is that they again as i said the concept of private property has certain upper bounds limitations in the islamic uh, concept and um, and second it's a question of distribution which is uh, ba- which is based on the family uh, um uh, and 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 we will she will see later that this is essentially also the basis of charity um in an islamic um, economy the importance of society and the family rather than the state in in distribution so no inheritance tax and uh, limitations on how much you can actually um uh, give away as as will uh, because all other guidelines are defined very clearly um one important um the institution which has um kept uh, quite uh, consistent uh, as an as as entity is institution of waqf which goes to the prophet time himself uh, so um and it is also reported um in um that he saw some uh, he saw a jewish tribe actually practicing some kind of an early work and he adopted that institution as an islamic institution which essentially means that um the a person who can uh, who can actually uh, define and 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 um so work was identified as a civil society institution developed by early muslim societies that enable people to resist vigorously any attempt by the state to take over the wealth of individuals um so the purpose of a trust uh, as the normal current english law also acknowledges uh, provides this kind of um, protection to the uh, uh, to the trustee owner to trust owners uh, in in um, in in the sense of what can be the purposes and what can be the uh, use of such trust and the income from the trust um and again this establish uh, a, a very fine balance between the private ownership uh, which is given 
importance over the state control. So trusts were providing protection to individuals against the state. Uh, the trust came with this um, religious sanction. So once the trust is defined, then actually state was not allowed to change the objectives, um, to change the purpose of for which it was originally established. And it served uh, for centuries as an institution for social welfare. Um, not just for social welfare, also for um, uh, for needs such as uh, health care, uh, travel, um, and, and during Ottoman Empire, trust was also used as a microfinance institution uh, for extending loans to entrepreneurs. Uh, so there are various uses of trust that we have seen of the Vakf, actually, uh, which we've seen um, have been used until uh, the the colonial times when these vaks these properties were taken over by the state so the all vaks properties were nationalized uh, and unfortunately after the uh, after the decolonization after the, the muslim majority countries um, assumed um, political freedom these you know many of or most of these institution vaks institutions remained with the state, which is currently the case. Uh, my um, my last slide on on the based on the you know on the economic principles as far well as the uh, primary sources of Islamic concern is this one. Um, this is um, a possible solution to negative externalities, which is often a subject of environmental economics um, um, and uh, uh, an incident is reported uh, which all which i have reported here a dispute occurred between two persons one having a tree on other other's land the landowner found trespassing on his land by the tree owner to be nuisance and so took the matter to the prophet and the prophet ordered the tree owner to sell the tree to the landowner and accept compensation or just simply give it to him. But the man refused and the prophet uh, then allowed the landowner to cut it down and he made the landowner pay the price of the tree. Um, this in my view uh, provides us a basic principle of how to solve the problem of negative externalities. Um, that is uh, the the harmful effects of transactions which are not uh, covered in the formal transaction process there are other people who are affected by um, that uh, that transaction uh, such as a factory producing um, you know a factory a, a factory which is polluting a downstream river and uh, that downstream a village who is dependent let's say on the fisheries in that um river uh, then loses its livelihood due to the factory then how can it be uh, solved um, of course this has been addressed by uh, by environmental ec economists based on transaction costs or we the we know uh cause theorem um well, i think there's a striking similarity and there is uh, imp important uh, guideline which can be drawn from here um, and again, it is important that in case of dispute, a decision is awarded while monetizing both costs and benefits to respective uh, parties. Um, so private property is preserved and then it's a monetization of the use, which is important ultimately. Um, in, in my second section of the presentation, I want to move to quickly um, to some um, examples of uh, classical views uh, which is um, um, which were mentioned by the jurists um, so it will give you some idea of how much in-depth thinking was present in our classical thinkers in terms of economic uh, policies and economic uh, dynamics um, for example this um, um, quote by Ibn Qudama, uh, who is um, a humbly jurist, 13th century. Uh, he he writes that uh, you know he he is 
he is the he belongs to the camp who uh, is literal follower of uh, this year that is no price control and he explains uh, in a way the price control the price control of price may give rise to price rise the traders from outside will not bring their goods in a place where they would be forced to sell them at a price against their wish so the local traders would hide the goods instead of selling people would have less than their need so they would prefer a higher price to obtain the goods both parties sellers and buyers would lose the sellers because they were prevented from selling their goods and the buyers because they were prevented from filling their fulfilling their needs so this act will be termed as forbidden um i i don't need to explain that um but this is a very comprehensive explanation of why price controls are, are bad in terms of welfare principles um again one of the towering figures of islamic thought and philosophy imam ghazali um uh, i present uh, his uh, basic uh, sets which i called uh, negative rights um, this is consistent with the idea of uh, a negative freedom that is freedom from coercion that according to him uh, the state is responsible for providing uh, these rights to the individual protection of religion protection of life protection of reason which is like uh, freedom of expression of uh, free protection of posterity uh, right to raise family and uh, protection of pro uh, of property these five rights are uh, provided um, and imam ghazali mentions that these are the the most fundamental pillars of rights which the state um, has to provide to its citizens um again a very uh, noteworthy um, philosopher social scientist historian ibn khuldun who who uh, has explained in his in, in muqaddima how prices are uh, determined um and he has given details of how uh, profit needs to be measured um, and um, how profit is actually accrued and the last line of his uh, statement is uh, you know very simple the truth about commerce i shall give you in two words buy cheap and sell dear that is commerce for you um i also wish to uh, present to you um the uh, what i consider the first form of law and supply and demand uh, except without a graph uh, from ibn taymiyah uh, writing in 14th century who uh, who who said that ibn taymiyah has a full book on economics um and so this is one quote from the book if desires for goods increases while well, supply decreases price rises but if supply increases and desire decreases prices uh, decline um so i those just few reflections of how our classical jurists were um looking at the you know economics and economic theory um in in sharp contrast i quickly uh, come to the modern Uh, discipline of Islamic economics, um, um, and um, I'm not going to, uh, you know, in, in going to, into details on on this aspect. But I have found that uh, for the modern Islamic economics, a subject which is a 20th century subject, as this subject as such didn't exist before. Uh, poverty for for um, uh, these economists is important, is more important as a subject matter. Uh, then then wealth creation and they prefer to discuss social justice uh, over economic freedom one of the important uh, figures in the islamic economics is uh, nawab haider naqvi and i i wish to present um, the main pillars of islamic economics as defined by nawab haider naqvi um and again he is a, a very respected scholar of islamic economics um and has, he has in the past and also advised gum and he was from pakistan he is from pakistan and uh, in terms of uh, you know how the islamization of economy should occur i have a look at these uh, points and the uh, level of composition of production and consumption 
will be under direct and indirect control of Islamic State society. Uh, all citizens, irrespective of their ability to earn, will be guaranteed a reasonable level of income. Uh, feasible rates of growth will be subjected to an upper limit to ensure a fair distribution of wealth and wealth, income and wealth now. Income uh, would be absolutely equalized. The distribution of wealth will be equalized. Exploitation will be minimized by making labor share a function of the total <coughs> profits of the industry. Excuse me. The institution of private property will be substantially diluted. Enterprises will be taken over by the state. Um, um, you, when you read about Islamic economics, other than the discussion about interest-free banking, I'm not going in that direction in this talk, you will often find these discussions. And uh, the notion which I have presented before you uh, which I believe is the true spirit of Quran and Hadith and all captured by classical scholars and jurists of Islam um, have unfortunately been lost um, in the modern Islamic economic discipline and um, in and in their urge to perhaps distinct themselves, uh, distinguish themselves from mainstream economics um, uh, they have perhaps gone to the other side uh, by um, yeah, by by drawing these kind of uh, conclusions, and uh, therefore I think it's important. I believe that um, um, more research is needed uh, to on the uh, on uh, on what I believe is the uh, there is a harmony between economic freedom and the classical Islamic foundations. But it, it, you know more research is needed um, to establish that. Um, we see some good books coming out recently, um, and hopefully, the um, the challenge which is before us, um, who are interested to discover the Islamic foundations of uh, free markets um, uh, and, uh, and economic freedom, is not just to explore and discover these principles and say, okay, great. Uh, I found Ibn Taymiyyah saying something about law and supply and demand, or I found something about negative externality in in a in a, in a, in a hadith, uh, or I found uh, uh, a notion about uh, you know price freedoms um, or voluntary trade in in Quran. But the, I think the challenge is that can we use some of these insights to address some of the important puzzles in the modern economic uh, debate or not that is um, uh, that is a challenge uh, that is an intellectual challenge but uh, my um, main purpose of today's uh, uh, webinar is actually to just present to you before uh, the first part which is the exploration and discovery of uh, principles of economic freedom and market economy in the islamic foundations thank you so much for your patient uh, hearing I hope that we can have some conversation. Thank you. Ira. Uh, thank you very much, Ali. Uh, that was very insightful and enlightening, especially for me, who uh, I jump back on economics. So that was very useful. Um, may I know if anyone has any questions? Uh, I can think from mean the question reads have you read timur quran's research on so i read a first question here which is by uh, muhammad amin he um, he says that uh, have you read timur quran's research on waqf in the ottoman empire uh, yes uh, the timur quran is actually uh, critical uh, of the role played by uh, the waqf in the ottoman empire and he has argued that uh, waqf uh, as understood and as practice in the islamic history uh, played a role which was not positive which was not conducive for economic development they were they might have actually uh, been on the other side they they actually uh, sort of led to decline of islamic um, uh, civilization or so, or social institutions um, the uh, the you know the the book which I mentioned in the last slide, which is still here, uh, Benedict Kohler, 
uh, Bennett Cohen has actually addressed some of these aspects, and um, and there also there is uh, you know, research which um, I quoted in this presentation uh, by Masli Malik, for instance, um, in which he, he has found the uh, uh, the evidence that. Um, actually, Vakf were not as rigid, rigid as an institution as uh, as the Quran has argued, and um, they were uh, they, they they were not to be blamed for the lack of development. Um, and in fact, this book by Kohler is interesting because it 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 shows that uh, within Ottoman Empire, for instance, uh, there were uh, these. Uh, uh, free trade, free trade zones, or, or um, uh, what called um, funduk, the 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 special zones for non-Muslims who were able to operate uh, as per their own laws. So there were multiple multi uh, multiple legal systems existing um, in the Islamic heartland, just to encourage actually more trade and commerce. Um, so, um, uh, so that's that, that's the other viewpoint. But uh, but yes, the uh, Quran work on um, on research is is quite critical of the role of us. Um, I mean, I have asked uh, a rather difficult question. Uh, do you consider that the Quranic inheritance rules were specific to Arab society at that time, or whether they were intended to be universal and uh, timeless? Um, in my humble opinion, um, generally Quran um, has um, um, avoided providing the details of um, uh, of systems um, such as um, economy, politics, uh, etc. Uh, however, there are instances where we actually have more, you know, we have actually detailed discussions. We have, um, um, and, and so the, the discussion on um, inheritance uh, laws, um, discussion on the importance of the contract, the, the longest uh, verse of Quran is on the contracts and documentation is in my view um, has um, has a more universal uh, appeal um, and uh, therefore I consider them to be to be valid um, as long as uh, Quran has not specified uh, the details uh, of, um, of of any system then I think it has been left to uh, discretion uh, but where it is mentioned perhaps it is mentioned in the sense of uh, being universally applicable. Okay, uh, if anyone else has uh, any other questions or Anything to add to Ali's presentation? We will Okay. 
Uh, I believe there are maybe a couple of questions coming up, uh, so we can wait for, uh, for a couple of minutes for more questions. Thank you, Vakas, and thank you, Mohammed Nasheen. All right, it seems that uh, no more uh, questions. Um, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here um, and participating in this discussion. Um, uh, what I have uh, presented before you is really an outline and a skeleton of my, um, my thought process. Um, I think um, it is important that um, uh, to 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 continue this kind of uh, discussion and uh, to perhaps do it in a more organized uh, manner. Um, uh, there, uh, just to share with uh, all of you, um, uh, there is um, I have been asked by the uh, Acton Institute. Um, which is a think tank based in the US actually to uh, formalize this argument in the form of a monograph, uh, which I uh, aim to complete uh, this year. So inshallah, uh, I'll be putting these thoughts more in an elaborate uh, manner. Um, I'll be happy to share the slides, um, I think. Uh, I, I don't know if you can download, to be honest. Uh, try, <laughs> but uh, but I'll I'll be able to share on email with all of you. Over to you, Ira. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ali Salman, uh, for that very uh, informative presentation. I'm sure all our participants this evening uh, had learned a lot from the presentation. And we are looking forward to reading your monograph. And um, I think that's all for me as well. So have a good evening and uh, have a good week.